the Himalayas have always attracted adventurers and truth seekers. The first traveler started visiting Nepal after it opened its borders for tourism at the end of the 60s. This small mountainous kingdom welcomed them with the magic of rituals, the power of Buddhist holy places, and stories of enlightened masters who had reached perfection. It seemed like there was a secret behind every door, and one could meet great yogis even on the street. In 1968, the Danish couple Ole and Han and Dido came to Kathmandu having chosen the city as their honeymoon destination. They dreamed of finding a teacher. We met him in 68. We were in Nepal twice in 68. The first time we only heard about him. We were buying some different things, interesting Nepalese things like some Tibetan artifacts, uh, also a bit of hash, <coughs> which was legal there at that time, you know. Ole and Hanna belonged to the generation of European idealists who were discovering new levels of consciousness and shaking up social principles in the 60s. Ole's research work for his diploma in philosophy was devoted to the psychedelic aspects of the works of Aldous Huxley. We went there and we were at that time still, you can say like hippies, we were trying different things, psychedelics, but at the, on that day we had not taken anything and we were very sober. For many people, the most sacred place of Kathmandu is the Swayamkhu Stupa. The Nepalese call it the Monkey Temple. Legend has it that many thousands of years ago, it appeared spontaneously on an island in the middle of a huge lake. The beneficial influence of stupas is immense. They bring peace and happiness to everyone who builds them, lives close to them, shows respect, walks around them, or meditates nearby. The shape of a stupa is rich in symbols, representing the structure of the universe and the qualities of mind. And we came to this woman again, um, the, the great uh, fine lady, you know, the Buddha Lakshmi Lama, was her name. And, uh, and she said, now my, my Lama is there. You know, Lupin Sechu Rinpoche is there, you can see him. And I remember we came in through the door there, there are always like fortresses, houses in that part of the world. There was a single pillar with a, with a flag, you know, a prayer flag, uh, which was there blowing good wishes into the wind. And then we got in there. Some people moved in and out, you know, in long uh, monks' robes and nun robes. They moved in and out, and we came. We came up to the second floor, and there we came in to the. We came up, and it was to our right. It was out towards the the street again, that direction, and we saw his shoes being there, and we took off our shoes and we went in. 
and then he was sitting there. And he was just very kind, you know, very easy. He had heard about us, she had told about us, he was happy, we liked it, we liked Buddhism. I mean, very, very simple, very easy in the beginning and so on. And then I noticed something that was really funny, you know. When I looked at him, I, I discovered I could see the wallpaper behind him. And that's strange, you know, because he was a normal looking gentleman, but he was apparently transparent. <laughs> So I wanted to be sure that it was not hypnosis, so I took up a solid Danish mat matchbox. At that time I smoked a pipe, so I always had these matchboxes along in Danish. They were made of wood at that time, solid things. So I lifted this up and I held that against him. And now if this had been hypnosis, then also the matchbox would have been uh, transparent because he would have been doing something to my mind, right? And I looked and the matchbox was totally solid, right? And he was still transparent. And I said, that's way out, you know, I mean, that's too much. Then I checked it a couple of times. I looked to the side and once I looked to the side, he was, he was solid. But once I looked at him again, he was transparent once more. And then I just, I got so touched, you know, I said, man, man this, he's just, you know, he's something else. You know, I was really touched about it. Hannah was also deeply impressed and we somehow had the good idea to bow down our heads even though we had never tried anything like that before. We just bowed down and he put his hands on our heads. Then um, we woke, uh, then uh, we went back. I don't even know how we got back. We got a rickshaw or walked parts of the way. We were like blown out. We saw all this clear light, you know, that he had put into us. We kept on there all the time, you know, and we were like, probably like robots, zombies. We moved down there.
And we had had incredible dreams, you know, I mean really, it was like somebody had just t taken our former life and, and shaken it, shaken it out on the, on the table in front, and especially the not so good thing. I fought a lot, I beat up a lot of people, I liked to go out and provoke fights in the bars at night and stuff like that. I did a lot of fighting and I always fought clean but I still hurt people, right? I never kicked anybody, I never hit anybody when they were weak, you know, or gave up or anything like that. But I still, you know, I did hurt a few. People looked like they'd been run over by a truck when I was through with them, right? So, you know, I mean, I, that was not nice to see again. and we just held our heads and we said, what was that, right? And then there were a couple of days where we had to digest that. It was the first time we looked inside and saw our own minds. It was the first time that really, you know, we, we discovered what we had been putting into our minds, you know, in all those years, you know, what, what kind of mixed stuff was there. <laughs> In our case, that was exactly what we needed. You know, we were quite, you know, we were quite proud and we definitely thought we knew very well everything, yeah. And he was so skillful, you can't imagine. He never lifted the finger and said, you know, you shouldn't do that, you shouldn't do that. He was so skillful. He just let us, he gave us a long line so that finally we from ourselves, we saw how senseless it was. And we just felt his kindness all the time filling up and that, you know, this was much more important. So he was just amazing. Meeting with Lopen Tsechu Rinpoche not only changed the lives of all in Hana, it also opened a way of development to thousands of people all around the world. I think Lopen Tsechu Rinpoche never, never left our life after that.
Ren Pache was born in 1918 in the Bhutanese town of Punakha, and he spent his early years in the village of Norbugan. Bhutan is a unique Buddhist country, and Buddhism is the way of life for its population. Even today, the atmosphere there remains almost unchanged for hundreds of years. During the last days of pregnancy, his mother was making offerings to a statue of the brick priest, Tara. When the child was delivered, the umbilical cord that held mother and baby together was cut, and a white liquid, not blood, started to fall into the ablution water. The looked and tasted like milk. She thought, this is odd, but I'm not so educated and only good at worldly things. Perhaps it is very good. A lama was invited to give a name to the child. While the lama was coming to give the hair-cutting ceremony for the boy, other lamas in the monastery started blowing horns. And the lama thought that this was a very auspicious sign and named the baby Damcho Gyatsen, victorious banner of true teaching. Popen Tsechu grew up as a normal Bhutanese boy. There is a tradition in the Himalayas to recognize high teachers already in their childhood. Such incarnated lamas are called tulku. But Lopen Tsechu was not recognized as a tulku, though all the people around noticed his unusual qualities, especially his exceptionally kind heart. When Rinpoche was around 10 years old, then a kind of pest uh, uh, spread around Bhutan and it affected also this area. And within two weeks, a lot of members of Rinpoche's family passed away. And also his father passed away. In 
and the mother of Rinpoche was left suddenly alone with three small children, with Rinpoche, with his younger sister and with his youngest brother. Because it was not the best solution to stay here due to the pest which was still around and also due to the fact that after the father passed away and after all the family members passed away, their financial conditions were not the best. Rinpoche's mother decided to go to Nepal. So the four of them, the mother with the three children, small children, they crossed the Himalayas walking to Tibet and then from Tibet they came to Nepal. So it was really very dangerous. That was really a great adventure. You must think about the altitude, you must think about the wild animals and also they had nothing to eat, they had no money and that was a great hardship for Rinpoche. He was always mentioning to me that no matter how far we travel and how much struggles we have during these trips, one can not compare it with the first trip that he did in his life, that was the trip from Bhutan to Nepal. The great yogi and uncle of Lopen Tsechu, named Sharab Dorje Renpache, lived in Nepal. At the invitation of the Nepalese king, he was restoring the Swayamhu Stupa, the most ancient in the world, which had fallen into disrepair. His uncle taught the young Rinpoche all the Buddhist methods. Years spent in retreats and joint meditation enabled Lopen Tsechu Rinpoche to realize the true nature of phenomena. On the Buddhist path, a practitioner gradually gets to understand that the mind is unlimited and free of any obstacles. Being unaware of this, one perceives everything as being real, holds on to what one likes, and tries to avoid unpleasant things at all costs. Thus, one makes mistakes and consequently gets trapped by suffering. But if one discovers the unlimited qualities of mind, one can see that highest truth is the highest joy. In my previous life, I, Drukpa Rinpoche, had the name of Sharab Dorje. In the highest sense of Dharma, as well as being my nephew, Lopen Sechu Rinpoche was also my son at that time. And now in this life, when I was very young, Lopen Sechu Rinpoche, due to his special abilities of clairvoyance, recognized me and introduced me to Chitsang Rinpoche and Yalwa Karmapa. From my infancy, he provided me with everything that was needed. He gave me teachings and took care of me. In my previous life, he was my nephew, and in this life, he became my tutor, my father, my mother, and it is due to him that I gained all those qualities on the way of my development. He was my Lama. This is our connection.
Rinpoche knew a lot about different Buddhist traditions. Sakya, Gelu, Kaju, He knew their teachings perfectly and practiced their meditations. And it made no difference between the practitioners of these traditions in the sense of I am like this, and he is like that. He is bad, and I am good. He used to see the best in different traditions and groups, and then practiced in meditation. What a habit! Lopen Setsu Rinpoche's main practice was the meditation on the Bodhisattva of compassion called Chenrezi, or loving eyes. To be a Bodhisattva means to take care of others without thinking of yourself and to totally devoting oneself to the benefit of all. Chinrezi expresses the kindness and compassion of all the Buddhas. His love is like the sun, which gives its light to all beings impartially. Lopan Setsu spent most of his life in the Kathmandu Valley. It was thanks to him that Buddhism blossomed and developed a strong position. At his initiative, the construction of monasteries, schools, bridges and hospitals was carried out. Many Nepalese people became Buddhists. On the outskirts of Kathmandu stands a sacred Nagarjuna hill, the name of a great Indian Buddhist master who lived almost 20 centuries ago. Rinpoche loved to meditate there. Rinpoche was always surrounded by people. They asked for his advice, blessing, or support. It happened that sometimes refugees from Tibet came to him without money and unable to speak Nepalese. He never refused to help anyone. Lopan Setsu Rinpoche was versed in all the Buddhist teachings, in philosophy, logic, and cosmology. He was able to explain the most intricate aspects of the teachings. If there was a drought in the valley, then Rinpoche came alone to the Nagarjuna hill in order to hold a special ritual. He would meditate until the rain started. It was only at 86 that we really discovered that we could take him to the West. The West met the Lama with great interest and trust. Once, when Rinpoche was flying to Venezuela with a group of friends, the plane crew asked him for Buddhist refuge. Right in the air, at an altitude of 10,000 meters above the Atlantic, the whole crew was lined up near the cockpit, repeating the traditional formula. I take refuge in the Buddha in his teachings and in the friends on the way.
From the time of the Buddha, everyone who has taken refuge has stepped onto the path of realizing the true nature of mind. In Buddhism, refuge is explained as a system of values, the most important of which is the limitless space of mind itself where all phenomena, thoughts and feelings appear, change constantly and disappear again. Well, he came right into the family. We gave him the whole company. When he came, we said, you are our teacher, and that means you're also the teacher of our students, right? By that time, Oli Nido had become one of the first fully qualified Western Buddhist lamas of Karmakaju tradition. Upon the request of His Holiness Karmapa, Oli and Hana founded dozens of Diamond Way Buddhist centers of the Karmakaju lineage around the world where Lopen Tsetsu Rinpoche used to come and give traditional Buddhist teachings. Maggie Leonard, who became his indispensable helper, Hana Nido, who translated his teachings from Tibetan, and Pedro Gomez, who runs the Carmagin Meditation Center in Spain. According to a prophecy of the Inca tradition, it was written in their books. One of their brothers would come from another part of the world and change that, what they called consciousness. It would be the first contact of the two brothers, and it would be a certain lama from the city of Lhasa. During the time of his visit to Cusco, the ancient capital of Incas, the two main holders of the Inca tradition came down to take refuge from Rinpoche and to hold a ceremony of exchanging their highest knowledge. <laughs> Rinpoche noticed that one of the caves in the outskirts of Cusco looked very similar to the cave of Padmasambhava in Bhutan. He was sure that in ancient times, yogis from the Himalayas who could fly used to come there and give teachings. Therefore, there was this prophecy in the books of the Incas. In Buddhism, unusual powers such as Levitation and controlling the elements of nature are developed due to meditation. Oh, my God, I'm
Padmasambhava or Guru Rinpoche was one of the greatest Indian yogis. He brought Buddhism to Tibet and Bhutan in the 8th century. Most valuable here is a Guru Rinpoche statue, which one says has the quality of speaking. The story says that once it was decided to take the statue away from this old Lakang and to transport it to another place, and then the statue itself said it doesn't want to be taken away, it wants to remain here. So it has uh, been again put on its original place. And here uh, we have old paintings on the walls. We have a beautiful mandala on the ceiling of the Buddha of Long Life, Amitayus. We have also the three long life aspects, the Buddha Amitayus, Namgyalma and White Tara. We have also Guru Rinpoche together with his two main consorts, Yishitsogyal and Mandarava. The famous Tiger's Nest Monastery in Bhutan is named this way marking the time when Guru Rinpoche flew there riding a white tigress, which his consort Yeshe Tsogyal had transformed into. Through the power of their meditation, they pacified the local demons. Then they taught Buddhism for many years. Guru Rinpoche brought to Bhutan not a monastic Buddhism, but a yogi tradition, Tantra. Yogis and yoginis lived in the woods and caves. They wandered from place to place, maintaining a free way of life, which was not limited by usual norms of behavior. Their only commitment was to keep the continuity of meditation and pure view. During his whole life, Lopin Tsetsu Rinpoche kept a connection to Guru Rinpoche and transmitted his blessing to others. The monastery is nested in a cleft above a precipice situated almost one kilometer high above the valley. One can get there only by a narrow twisting path. It appears that in this place, the laws of gravity do not function. I think he was an emanation of Guru Rinpoche. He didn't want to say that he was incarnate, but I'm sure he was incarnate. There's absolutely no doubt. First, the name Tsi Chu, it means 10th day. And 10th day, that's the day of Guru Rinpoche. Then his different qualities were like that. And more than that, when he died, he died on the 10th day again, right, of the month. So I see no doubt, I have no doubt that, that he was uh, an emanation of Guru Rinpoche. and so on, and I've seen many cases his wishes being fulfilled and so on, but we always talk about two kinds of miracles. We have the ordinary miracles, and the ordinary miracles are actually when you lift things in the air or make things happen that are impossible, or you appear in two places at the same time, you know, or all these different things that can happen, and, and that was also known by Lopin Sitchin, that he actually did that or that he just disappeared from rooms, he just wasn't there, right? And a while after he was there again, and he didn't come and he didn't go, you know, I mean, these kinds of things, I mean, many stories about that. And we also, Hannah and I saw, really what he did as being magic. But the really important, the really important uh, powers is not playing with the laws of nature. 
that's not so special. You know, the really important powers is you're able to touch people's hearts and you're able to take them from suffering to joy, from black thoughts to white thoughts, from, from pain to happiness and so on. This is a really important thing. And there he touched everybody. Those miracles he made every day. Wherever he was, you know, he was just so extraordinary. He was really like our father.